A new 100-page paper you co-wrote titled Payments and the Evolution of Stable Coins and CBDCs in the Global Economy was just released last week. Now, that paper looks into how stable coins and CBDCs or central bank digital currencies could help the U.S. achieve economic benefits that other countries already enjoy. It also looks into policy and how the digital currencies can be regulated effectively. Before we get into your findings, I want to start off by asking, how long did it take you to put together this report, and why did you feel this was something that was absolutely necessary? Um, great question, Stalia. Um, this was a 100-page report. Um, it's designed to be fairly broad, a base to look at uh, payments, to explore stable coins and CBDCs, as well as to survey policy. And as you know, Talia, this is a very fast-moving area, and so just keeping up with the latest developments um, was a lot of work. But uh, this report was super fun to write because what it tries to do was address um, a very big need in our economy, which is to make sure that our payment system works to the maximum efficiency that we can get it to work. Um, the payment system is really everything. It allows money to move fast. It allows money to move cheaply. It gets people into the economic uh, perimeter. Um, and so the payment system is really the lifeblood of any financial and economic system. And making it work as best as it possibly can um, is really a policy objective that lawmakers and um, industry folks really need to embrace. Now, the US payment system, um, as much as it feels kind of very um, innovative, particularly after the pandemic, um, as we're kind of using our phones more and contactless payments and so forth, um, even though it feels like it's innovated a lot and it has, um, it's still a system that in its underlying infrastructure can sometimes be quite slow, um, can sometimes be um, expensive to move money from one account to another. And very importantly, it's not a system today that includes everyone. Um, here we have, uh, you know, vast sections of the population who are unbanked and underbanked. So approximately 4.5% uh, of U.S. households are unbanked. No one in the household has a bank account. Approximately 14% of US households are underbanked, which means that occasionally they're using expensive services like check cashing or pawn, uh, pawn shops uh, to meet their financial needs. And so in these circumstances, making sure that our financial system can include everyone, that the benefits of digitization can encompass everyone, that's a really core goal. The payments report was trying to explore whether stable coins and CBDCs can potentially provide solutions to some of these issues that are really endemic within the US payment system today. Thank you for that comprehensive overview. And just going back to that first question, how long did it take you to put this all together? Um, I think it probably took around six months. Um, so it was, you know, I started, uh, you know, we started doing this report around September, um, putting pen to paper. Um, and, you know, it, 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 it takes its time. And so, you know, these are things that need um, sort of reflection, particularly when thinking about some of the questions that policymakers today need to address to make sure that innovation that is happening in the digital asset space can be useful, um, that there are in fact use cases that can be applied to move the needle in terms of making the financial system more inclusive and the payment system more inclusive and efficient, um, that you know these use cases are backstopped by a system of regulation that is really thoughtful and that ensures that um, the technologies and the risks that they pose are properly dealt with. And so, you know, that part, that kind of policy part, even though it's probably the shortest just in terms of length, it took the longest because that's really the, the focus for how to get all of this right, uh, to make sure that these new emerging technologies can be handled in a way that makes them maximally usable without creating new risks within the financial system. Expanding on that, the report is broken down into three sections. The first section focuses on the U.S. payment system it then moves on to stable coins and CBDCs and concludes with the topic of regulation, which includes some key considerations for reform. Can you take us through some of your findings? I know you noted some already, but what are some of the main takeaways, especially as it pertains to how stable coins and CBDCs can address certain challenges? That's a terrific question, Talia, and I think it, it goes to the heart of what the larger regulatory project here is, which is trying to make our payment system um, be the world-class payment system that it can be. And the reason why our payment system, the U.S. payment system, is so important is because it's the payment system for the U.S. dollar. And the U.S. dollar is the international reserve currency. Um, it's the currency that is 
used um, across the globe um, to facilitate trade. I believe the latest figures were around 70 percent of, you know, trading is undertaken in um, in U.S. dollars. And so, you know, the, getting the international as well as domestic payment system right, making sure that money can move from one account to another fast, cheaply and uh, broadly, uh, that is really the core goal of this report. And thinking about whether stablecoins and CBDCs could potentially provide solutions to make the system work more efficiently um, is key here in not only making sure that our system can work really well domestically, but also maintaining the U.S. kind of hegemony, as it were, sovereignty, monetary sovereignty, ensuring that that is something that can we can really take advantage of through a super fast and effective and efficient um, U.S. dollar international payment system. So you asked about the findings, Tally, and I think this is this is something that is um, very uh, close to all of our hearts here, which is that the U.S. payment system has been innovating a lot, but there are some real places where it can be improved. First and foremost, this is a system that continues to have a large issue with inclusivity. There is a, a, an underbanking problem. There's an unbanking problem in the U.S. Um, communities, uh, lower income communities, communities of color, single parent households, um, you know, um, folks with um, without a college degree. Um, these are, you know, these are communities that have not been able to enjoy the fullest benefits of the, the digitization that we've all see happen over the last five years. So as you know, Talia, it's, you know, cash is now becoming less and less used within the economy. At the same time, within certain communities, um, cash is still the main uh, main medium of exchange. So looking at communities of color, low income communities and others, um, they continue to use cash broadly. In addition, money takes a long time sometimes to move from one account to the other. Um, so when we were thinking about um, money that you might get from uh, your salary payment, for example, sending money to pay your bill, oftentimes using the ACH network can take at least one business day, if not longer. In addition, if you want to cash a check, that takes one or two business days to complete. That's a long time. And even if we are using technologies like the Cash App or Zelle or Venmo to send money directly to one another to split the bill at dinner or to split the rent, um, to take money out of those apps and into our account, that can still take one or two business days um, unless you want to pay money for it to go faster. And so these are all costs on the efficiency and usability of the system. Now, other countries, what this report highlights, are actually making and have made dramatic strides in making their payment system much more digital, much more inclusive, and much more user-friendly. And these include countries with large populations, including many that have had traditionally um, issues with financial exclusion. So Brazil, for example, in 2020, introduced a payment scheme called PIX, Within about two years, um, approximately half the population in Brazil now uses PICS. Over the pandemic, Brazil has reduced underbanking by approximately 70%. Um, and, you know, this is becoming a system that is so widely used that even folks within the Brazilian street economy are using PICS to pay and receive payments. In fact, many of their COVID stimulus payments were sent using PICS. India, now the world's most populous nation, is using a real time payment scheme where Money is flowing instantly between people within the economy. Um, the UK, for example, has had faster payments since approximately 2009, 2010. The EU, Singapore and others, um, you know, we could go on. Uh, what the report provides is, a, is an analysis of where the international uh, where the international picture is currently, and specifically the fact that other countries have done a lot to modernize their payment infrastructure in order to create these efficiencies uh, for their payment system. And so, you know, what this what this report then goes on to to to, to think about is whether stable coins, um, essentially tokenized, digitally tokenized representations of value that are moving on these blockchains, whether they can provide some kind of solution potentially to underbanking, to uh, faster payments, and to making the U.S. dollar international system work much more efficiently. CBDC, similarly, um, having uh, the fact of being backstopped by the state, whether these claims can provide a way to provide cheap and inclusive payment scheme for um, for the for for you know for everyone. Um, so really, that's been the focus of this report. And finally, Talia, as you noted earlier, to think about some of the policy prescriptions that may be needed in that context. 
You noted this earlier, but the paper outlines possible use cases exploring how CBDCs and stable coins can be used in practical ways, both separately and together. One example involving stable coins is the ability to help provide standardized and reliable payment mechanisms within emerging digital economies. You note that current iterations of major stable coins have proven capable of being transferred across borders rapidly on blockchains or through crypto exchanges, which can help users avoid the fees associated with the standard foreign exchange transactions. Can you talk about this use case and others you discovered through your research? It's what we're seeing internationally, Talia, which is that stable coins um, and crypto as well has become a uh, pretty well used payment mechanism for uh, particularly for countries where local domestic payment mechanisms have not functioned as well or where trust in the local currency is is lacking. And so what we see, for example, in different studies is that international remittances, for example, often have increasingly are often increasingly showing use of crypto and stable coins as a means of transferring value. In addition, for folks that are displaced, um, there has been uh, there has been a movement towards converting local currency into stable coins as a way to make it more usable, to make it more movable, um, in order to take advantage of the fact that these uh, digitized, tokenized uh, uh, representations are essentially moving across international blockchains where transactions can happen relatively cheaply and where there is an infrastructure exchanges as you noted where um, these uh, where these claims can be turned into fiat currency uh, where they where they can be converted back into uh, whatever currency um, local folks are using and so clearly we're seeing this happen internationally domestically obviously stable coins here in the US tend to be used much more uh, much more frequently in the crypto context and so the the inquiry here is whether or not stable coins can be part of schemes for example that could enable business to business payments rapidly, potentially paired with smart contracts that could enable um, certain certain payments to be made in an automated way, potentially preventing late fees, um, whether, um, you know, the fact of having stable coins can enable businesses to send money internationally much more cheaply, where uh, different uh, parts of an organization are plugged into the same stable coin network. Um, you know, these are all thought experiments for how to make this technology work for the U.S. marketplace uh, to maintain and increase and enhance the position of the U.S. economy and the U.S. dollar um, to use these technology, you know, to use these technologies in a beneficial way. Um, and so really that, you know, that is one use case here. Um, but in addition, obviously, to make this work, we need regulation to, uh, to essentially ensure that these technologies are working um, and that the assets, for example, that are backstopping the stablecoin network to ensure that the resiliency of the network itself can be tested, um, can, be, uh, can be monitored, and that those who are issuing these stablecoins, issuing these claims are properly overseen. So um, this is part of a larger uh, a larger ecosystem of thinking about the use cases, who might use them, what the what the economic case for their implementation is likely to be, and very importantly, what the regulatory picture here needs to look like to enable these technologies to be used in as safe a way as possible. Stable coins made headlines a few times in the past year. Last May, for example, the algorithmic stablecoin Terra USD and sister coin Luna failed. And just last month, the U.S. House Financial Services Committee published a draft version of a stablecoin bill in the first major piece of crypto legislation this year. Now, you say this new report offers policymakers and the industry a, quote, roadmap to leveraging digital assets in a way that can be useful for society. So in a nutshell, what did you determine is the most effective and safe way to regulate stablecoins and CBDCs? Well, the report tries to avoid being super prescriptive, Talia, about these are the exact steps that are needed to, to, to make stable coins um, as safe as possible. I think what the report tries to do was set out key areas where regulators need to pay attention to ensure that the stable coin um, technology can be implemented most effectively. So first and foremost, what this paper raises, um, as you noted with the collapse of Terra Luna, um, Talia, is to make sure that the technology itself is safe. For example, to ensure that you know the the stable coins that are um, that are used and that are useful are those that can provide maximum safety, credibility, and assurance for their users. So what has come out, for example, even in the the context of the of the congressional bill, is that algorithmic stable coins, for example, 
are not particularly popular uh, in D.C. Uh, we've seen the fact that they uh, tend to lack a, 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 a concrete backing, a reserve of assets that can be looked to um, to support their function. And so thinking about, you know, what kinds of stable coins will work is a is a key part of, of the policy discussion here. And when uh, when sort of looking at that, the next question is what kind of assets count? So what are the highest quality assets that can backstop these claims? Who can issue these claims? Can banks do it only or can non-banks also be involved here? In order for that to function, do non-banks, for example, have to keep these reserves assets in bank accounts or can they instead potentially get a master account with the Fed? Um, as we saw in the case of uh, the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank, circles, um, dollars that were held in Silicon Valley Bank, approximately $3 billion, um, you know, that was uh, over that weekend, uh, there was a lot of doubt about whether or not um, circle, in fact, um, you know, what would happen to those uh, to those uninsured uh, dollar sums in the Silicon Valley Bank at that time it was collapsing. And so um, thinking about what kind of stable coins will qualify, what kind of assets for asset backed stable coins, what kind of assets will work, um, who the issuers can be banks or non banks, what kind of protections they need in order to ensure they can do this safely. Do they need a Fed account or can bank accounts work? Um, these are all part of the taxonomy of questions this report raises to ensure these um, to ensure that regulators have some kind of roadmap to think about what factors are important in implementing these technologies. In your research, you point to data from the Atlantic Council, which noted that 115 countries are actively exploring the possibility of introducing a CBDC, with 60 countries already in an advanced phase of the process. Now, the U.S. hasn't officially launched a CBDC, but in September, the White House came out pointing out the risks and benefits associated with the central bank digital currency. Those benefits include facilitating efficient and low-cost transactions, fostering greater access to the financial system, and boosting economic growth. Now, risks mentioned include the potential to compromise the stability of the financial system and the protection of sensitive data. What is your take on those arguments from the White House? Yeah, this is a very complicated question, um, introducing a digital version of the dollar. And it needs to be done right for it to work. Um, you know, the problem that lawmakers and policymakers are facing is that we are using public money less and less because essentially what we're doing is gravitating towards digital, the digital uh, payments marketplace. Now, taking a step back, what is public money? Public money is money that is uh, backstopped by uh, the promise of the central bank to ensure that they will pay whatever is 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 owed um, and whatever is represented by the paper money. So what we have here in the context of public money in the U.S. is essentially cash. For average people, for everyday people, our interaction with public money, money that is backstopped by the central bank, is essentially cash. Yeah. Um, and increasingly, what we're seeing is a much less frequent use of cash today. Um, and increasingly, I turn towards private money claims, which is claims that are issued by banks or um, digital payment providers um, that essentially we're using those kinds of private claims more and more. Now, private money is obviously something that we're all extremely used to using. At the same time, as this banking crisis shows, sometimes banks fail. These claims need to be protected, as the Federal Reserve did, um, the FDIC did, um, all the way through uh, March during the banking crisis and continues to do. And so, you know, thinking through uh, the fact that um, today uh, regulators are looking for ways to, um, to put public money in the hands of people who don't want to use cash, CBDCs provide one way to try and, and do that, essentially a digital representation of cash that people can carry around in their pocket. Now, obviously, Talia, as you noted, uh, this raises concerns potentially uh, about financial stability and certainly about data and other governance issues. Um, the financial stability risks arise because essentially there's a, a potential danger here that folks will opt into a publicly backstop claim, the CBDC. Um, the folks will now will, will turn away from the banking system, turn away from potentially riskier private claims, and instead look towards public money, the CBDC, as a way to feel safer um, in the marketplace. So that is a financial stability risk that needs to be addressed to ensure that there's a good balance between public money and private money within the system. Now, the risk that most of us are super concerned about in our everyday lives is making sure that our data 
is properly uh, is properly safeguarded, is protected, that using the CBDC does not mean that we're going to be surveilled, that the central bank is going to keep data on us, that um, that the that the state can then use this data in order to um, take actions against us. So clearly, there's going to be a huge need for solutions that provide that governance to support a CBDC that can be trusted by the marketplace as a whole. That is a critical condition to making sure that people feel like they can use it. Without people using it, there's no network effects, there's no, uh, there's no, uh, there's no desire for everyone to have it in their pocket, and the CBDC will die. For example, uh, as we saw in the case of Nigeria recently, uh, the CBDC trial wasn't particularly popular uh, because folks did not have trust in the actual CBDC itself. So clearly, there's an important need here to make sure that the governance of any CBDC is properly done. This cannot be undertaken lightly. And finally, the U.S. dollar, as we know to Italia, is the international reserve currency of choice, which means that any move that we make to recalibrate the format of the dollar into a digital form has to be done safely, has to be done very thoughtfully, and in a way that ensures that it's maximally usable without sort of disrupting the flow of the international dollar payment system. So clearly these are considerations for any CBDC, particularly for the dollar CBDC, and clearly what the Fed is doing here and what other countries are doing are taking trial steps, uh, putting sandboxes in place to see how um, a CBDC could, it, could be put in place and what kind of appetite there is locally in order to use it. So you also worked on another research paper that came out last month on regulation by enforcement, which as we all know is not exactly popular with some crypto companies. Uh, in your research, you analyze the incentives facing agencies when choosing this approach. You also lay out a framework for when agencies should regulate through enforcement action. So I'm curious to know what stood out to you when compiling this research on the topic of regulation by enforcement? Yeah, so uh, my co-authors and I, Chris Bummer and David Zering, um, Georgetown and Wharton respectively, what we wanted to do with this paper was essentially um, unpack this concept of regulation by enforcement. As you know, to tell you, it's, it is a catchphrase that is being used um, across the industry as well as by policymakers to reference this tendency to use litigation as a way of creating um, norms within the industry rather than going through a rulemaking process. And what we wanted to do was kind of unpack it discuss its history, figure out essentially whether or not um, the claims that some folks have made, whether or not this is illegal, for example, whether those claims can even be substantiated. And what we found here was uh, complex and nuanced. Um, regulation by enforcement is most certainly legal. Uh, for you know, this is uh, this is supported by the case law, extensive case law that speaks to the fact that agencies do have enormous discretion in using um, enforcement as a way to forward uh, their mandate to oversee and regulate the marketplace. However, what we also show here is that regulation by enforcement where agencies take steps into novel areas, uh, where um, agencies are using um, enforcement strategies to create potentially novel theories or test out novel theories, that that can create some risks here, that that is not something that is free of consequence. In other words, there's some significant risks that could uh, face industries, particularly from the judicial system, uh, that may push back against these incursions of authority into novel areas. That is where regulation by enforcement is a risky strategy for agencies that are looking to uh, oversee innovating um, and rapidly changing marketplaces. And so finally, what we also show in this paper is thinking about some of the trade-offs that regulation by enforcement creates, even where it's legal. So for example, um, you know, regulators have a, uh, a host of tools that they can use in order to oversee the market, of which adjudication enforcement is one pathway. Um, regulators can, of course, of course, do rulemaking. They can use softer tools like interpretation and guidance. And each of these um, pathways comes with trade-offs. So for example, taking the regulation route uh, means that agencies are going through a notice and comment procedure. They're talking with the industry and larger stakeholders um, and taking comments and, and having this discussion about what kind of um, regulation could work best and, and most uh, efficiently for a particular marketplace. 
interpretation and guidance can respond to fast moving areas of the law where agencies can kind of give a, a quick take about what they consider uh, the risks of a particular activity to be. So there's a, a host of tools that regulators can use here. And what this paper tries to do is think about regulation by enforcement in this larger context of the toolkit that agencies have at their disposal. Now, when we spoke in February, shortly after you testified on Capitol Hill, you stressed that the crypto industry needs regulation extremely quickly as the industry's reputation is in tatters following the collapse of FTX and other scandals. Now, just last month, EU lawmakers approved the world's first comprehensive framework for crypto regulation. What does this signal for the U.S. and what do you think it will take for us to catch up? The framework under Mika is definitely a... Uh, a big step that has been taken by the EU to position itself globally as a potential crypto hub, um, as a hub for digital assets and as a way to create some uh, ability to set standards that can arguably be used as international standards more broadly. Um, so one thing the U.S. has done historically is essentially lead the global marketplace in setting standards for various kinds of financial innovation. Particularly following the crisis, we have been leaders in setting these, uh, you know, basic standards, benchmarks for what constitutes uh, safe and sound standards for bank regulation, for example, for derivatives regulation, for exchanges and clearing houses, um, and so forth. We've been very much at the forefront of that conversation. And our views and our policy objectives have therefore been translated into global standards, which in turn have been implemented across the board, um, creating a arguably a more level playing field for financial innovation globally. What the EU has done is essentially set up MICA, Amica as the um, as the as the first fairly comprehensive regulatory roadmap for crypto and digital assets. And what this is saying essentially is that the default standard that they've created for their uh, for their 27 markets is something arguably that could set that standard for the global marketplace more broadly. Now, the danger this creates for us is that potentially um, companies that are digital asset companies within the U.S. might look to opt into the Mika framework where they feel like they have regulatory certainty. In addition, if they do do so, they may feel that they have access to 27 different markets as well as potentially um, a much larger marketplace where other countries too adopt Mika standards going forward. Now, the, for us, what that could also mean then is that we become followers rather than leaders, that our policy prescriptions essentially reference Mika, what Mika is doing, um, how Mika is structured, um, you know, conventions regarding how crypto exchanges should be regulated, crypto brokers, definitions regarding digital assets and so forth, that we're doing that in reference to Mika rather than doing our to doing our thing and having other countries essentially follow us. And so one of the dangers essentially of not having rulemaking or not thinking about rulemaking in this context in a comprehensive way is that we lose this international race to set standards. And, and that is something that should be of huge concern to anyone um, that works in financial regulation because the market is global, uh, companies are global, and they will as they are doing already, voting with their feet to go into jurisdictions where they feel that they can do business at lowest cost and with greatest legal certainty. Now, I want to end off by noting that you were at Consensus in Austin last week. And so I'm I curious was. to know what's your take on sentiment? Well, covering the conference, I spoke with a crypto analyst who said he immediately noticed overall attendance was down this year compared to last and that there weren't as many traditional finance firms at Consensus this year. Is there anything that jumped out at you? For me personally, it was my first time at Consensus, so I don't have anything essentially to compare it to. But what was very obvious was that the mood was certainly one of, um, was one of reflecting on the major topic of the day, which is regulation. Um, I think almost every conversation in that room was at some point or the other focused on regulation and how to address the fact of regulatory uncertainty within the crypto and digital asset industry. The consequence of that conversation, I think, was essentially that there is this sort of clear convergence within the industry as a whole, that regulation is something that folks within this industry are looking for answers to. And I think the consensus conversations that happened last week were very substantive um, to those issues. Um, there was a range of speakers that came forward. And so even though attendance was down, uh, potentially, I, uh, you know, I think, I think the conversations are very rich. Um, the conversations were very substantive. Um, the range of speakers was speaking to um, what folks were looking to hear about, which is thinking about regulation here. 
And I think it provided um, an impetus, I think, um, at least that was my take from the conversations I had for industry to, to think more about cooperating and collaborating and, and working out ways in which to speak to regulators to try and get the answers that they're looking for. So I think it provided that space for folks to come together um, to think about a topic which everyone is interested in. Um, the speakers were awesome. Um, and I think, you know, it was it was uh, it was an event that I think had its moment, which is to come at this time where there is this uncertainty and, and, and it came exactly exactly this moment to, to get folks together to think about and talk about that. Yesha Yada, Professor of Law and Associate Dean at Vanderbilt Law School, thank you very much for taking us through your research and other headlines in the world of crypto. Talia, thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure.